it actually worked. Welcome back to AP Physics 1 with Mr. Iqbal. Uh, today we're going to be looking at lab number uh, this one over here, um, which is to determine the moment of inertia of an unknown object. We'll be using rotational dynamics or rotational kinematics to solve for it. Um, and so the way about we're going to be doing it experimentally is using this beautiful setup right here. So what you have is a rotational motion sensor and it's connected to our computer and what it does is as an object rotates it'll tell you what the angular velocity is. It'll actually plot the angular velocity as a function of time. It'll also plot the angular acceleration as a function of time. What we'll be doing for this lab is we'll be taking some mass um, of a uh, known value and it's going to hang from this object right here. We'll rotate it, we'll rotate it. Here we go. And so we'll put it at some starting height and we'll let it drop. All right. So we'll let it drop. And as it's dropping, it's going to start to accelerate and also have an angular acceleration. Um, that will be plotted on this graph right here. Uh, once we've got that value, we'll reset it and we'll do it for a hanging mass of a larger value and then repeat that for a larger value and a larger value and then somehow using rotational um, dynamics or kinematics, you will be able to make a plot and from that plot you'll be able to extrapolate what the moment of inertia for this weird looking object is that has this piece, this piece a rod and a pulley all attached to it at once. The mass of this pulley, by the way, is massless, so we don't really worry about that. Um, all that's left to do is to actually get started and look at the theoretical ways of solving for each part. So let's do that right now. All right, so the first method to solving for I of this unknown object right here is using rotational dynamics. So here I have the pulley, and I didn't draw all the weird stuff that's on top, we just need to know what's happening at the actual pulley itself. So here we've got a little pulley system thing uh, with mass of the pulley, radius r, which is given by 2.5 centimeters, and it's attached to a massless pulley, which we don't care about, which is attached to a variable mass. We'll be changing the mass, and we'll see how the acceleration is affected by it. Um, so how do we solve for i using this method right here of rotational dynamics? Well, you draw a free body diagram for the object here and as well as the object over here. So if I were to look at this object right here, there's only one force acting on it. That's the force of tension. That's it. The force of tension is what's causing the uh, torque to occur. So when we do the sum of forces, uh, sorry, the sum of torques, it's equal to I times alpha. Of course, it's spinning faster and faster and faster, so there must be an angular acceleration. And our job is to solve for i. So then i is going to equal the sum of tor torques divided by alpha. And you might ask yourself, well, what's the sum of torques? There's only one torque. Torque is equal to the force and how far it's from the axis of rotation. So this force is a distance r. You can't see it from this side because it's kind of like flattened down. But the distance from here to here is also r. So we get tension times r divided by alpha will give us what the uh, moment of inertia is. Now the difficult part is figuring out what t is. Well, it's not really difficult, it's just the additional step. The angular acceleration, you can find two ways. So I'm going to give you graphs as I'm dropping the different masses, and the two graphs that you're going to get are the uh, angular velocity as a function of time, as well as the uh, angular acceleration as a function of time. And what you should see is that it's not spinning in the beginning and then all of a sudden it's going to spin faster and faster and faster. You'll get a straight line looking like that. Um, and it's, it's diagonal like this because the angular acceleration is a constant value. It's going to be accelerating because of this force only. And so the slope of this graph looks like this. So you should see some sort of constant line right here. Um, how you determine angular acceleration is up to you. You can either take the slope of this and call it A1, A2, A3, depending on the different masses, or you can look at just this graph and see where the uh, line is horizontal 
and that's going to be the angular acceleration. Up to you which one you decide. So the angular acceleration is given by the graphs. R is already given to us. Make sure to convert it into uh, meters. And then finally, tension. How do we solve for tension? You got to look in the, the direction of the variable mass. So there are two forces acting in that direction. It's going to be mvg. And going opposite of that would be tension. And it is accelerating downward, so that's going to be our positive direction. We can do the sum of forces equals mass of the variable times acceleration. And from here, what are the forces? It would be this positive and this negative because acceleration is pointing down. So you end up with mvg minus the force of tension equals mva. And then from here, we can determine um, what the tension is. But before I do that, I just want to let you in on a little secret. This acceleration is related to the tangential acceleration. So we can say that this acceleration is the same as alpha times the radius r. And so instead of writing mva, we can replace the a with alpha times r. So now we don't even need to know a. Last step is to solve for t. Tension is equal to, uh, what is that? So it's going to be mvg minus mv alpha times r. You can substitute this value into here. And there we have our slope. So what we're going to have is I is equal to tension, which is mvg minus mv alpha times r. You're going to multiply all of that by r, and you're going to divide all of this by alpha. So tension right there, r right there, alpha right there. And so that's how you determine i. You're going to be doing this for different masses, which will result in different accelerations. So what are you really plotting? You're going to take this value right here in the numerator. So when you take this and this and then this, this is the net torque. So you're going to take the net torque and don't forget the units. The torque is newton meters. And on this axis, you're going to have alpha, which is radians per second squared. And this is alpha. So different angular accelerations are going to result in different torques. And you're going to plot those points, whatever that looks like. Draw the best fit line. And the slope of this is going to equal i. Um, we'll do it for three or four variable masses. Maybe, maybe not three. We'll do four or five variable masses. So you'll plot your points and you'll solve for i experimentally. This is the experimental value of i. Okay? Um, last thing is, well, what are you going to make your table of? Because in order to get this, you need a table, right? So the table, what do we want to put there? We're, well, first we're going to be changing the masses. The changing the masses, and we'll let it drop. We'll figure out what the angular acceleration is for each of those masses. If you have angular acceleration, you can then solve for tension. And once you have the tension, you can uh, multiply it by r, and you'll get the sum of torques. And then from there, you have this value, you have this value, you can plot it, and there you go. You found the experimental value of i. So next we're going to be looking at method. Okay, so here's method two for solving for the experimental value of i. Uh, we're going to be using conservation of energy and rotational uh, energy. So we've got an object here, we've got the object right here. Instead of telling you the radius this time, you don't need to know the radius of like to determine the torque. What we're going to do is drop it from a specific height. So every time I'm going to take a mass, a variable mass, um, and I'm going to put it at this height right here, I'm going to let it go, it's going to fall, and right before it hits the ground, all the energy that was in here has to equal the energy right before it hits the ground. So the energy before is equal to the energy after. And so now we can think about what's going on um, in the before picture and in the after picture. 
So here we're holding the system. I'm going to hold it like this. And then once I let it go, there's only one form of energy. Because it wasn't rotating, there's no kinetic rotational in the beginning. Because it was, this block wasn't moving down, there's no kinetic energy for this block. So the rotational energy has to go with here. The kinetic energy translational, or the linear kinetic energy, is for this object only. Um, and then this is creating a potential energy due to gravity. Uh, once it's almost hitting the ground, it didn't hit the ground yet, but right before it hits the ground here, all of the energy before got transferred into making this thing move with some speed and this thing rotate with some spinning speed. So right before it hits the ground, what are we going to say? Well, we could call this value right here y equals zero, and we can call this value right here y equals six e4.2 or 0.642 meters um, and that way there is no potential energy right at the bottom. So we can get rid of that and we are going to have kinetic energy linear because of this it's going to have some speed so that stays and this thing is going to be rotating so it must have some rotational energy. So the energy before is equal to the energy here. Over here we're going to write down mass of the variable times g, because that's the thing that's creating the energy, times the height that we're dropping it from. And over on the other side, we're going to get kinetic energy translational for this, which is going to be one half mass of the variable times v final squared. And v final is the final velocity right before it hits the ground. Finally, we're going to add to that the kinetic energy rotational which is given by one half i, that's the thing that we're looking for, the moment of inertia of this object, time its spinning speed, final. Because you gotta remember, this thing is accelerating, so the spinning speed doesn't stay the same. In the beginning, the spinning speed is zero. In the end, it's spinning with some velocity, uh, angular velocity there. Um, before we go any further, there is something interesting about the final velocity here and the angular velocity here. The final velocity right here, right before it hits the ground, is going to be the final velocity at this point right here that's going tangentially. So the linear velocity for this is exactly the same as the tangential velocity here. And we know the relationship between tangential velocity and the angular velocity. The tangential velocity is given by, I'll write it right here somewhere, the tangential velocity is given by omega times um, the radius r. So as I'm doing that, I just realized you kind of do still need r, don't you? So the radius r was the same value as in method one, which was um, 2.5 centimeters. So you still actually do need to know that value. Anyways, we can solve for omega, it's going to be, uh, we can solve for v, which is omega times r. So instead of writing v final here, I can get rid of that and write it as omega final squared times r squared. Beautiful. And our goal is to solve for i. So the last step to do is to solve for i. How are we going to do that? Let's see, we can get rid of the twos here and multiply this side by 2, and then you bring this to the other side, so you've got 2 mvgh minus mv omega final squared r squared, and there's a plus sign there, so we can divide the omega final to the other side, and that's squared, and all of this is going to equal i. So, we know what the mass of the variable is, that will be given to you. You know what the height is, you know what r is. The only thing you don't know is omega final, and that you're going to get from the graph again. So when I drop it, you'll see an omega versus time graph. You don't need the alpha versus time graph for this one. So you don't need the, uh, what is alpha? Angular acceleration graph. You just need the angular velocity graph. So looking at the angular velocity graph, that we get from the motion sensor, you should get a picture that looks something like this. It's not gonna have any angular velocity. It's gonna increase, it's gonna increase, and then it's gonna level off, like that. 
And so what we want is that velocity. We're looking for this velocity right here because that will be the final velocity. It's no longer changing after that point. So this is right before it hits the ground. This is the velocity at which the object is gonna be spinning. So you find that value and that will be your angular final velocity. Um, and what you wanna do is you just wanna make the slope of this. You know, Take this as your y axis, this as your x axis, and then you can solve. So if we were plotting this, we would have 2mvgh minus mv omega time omega final squared times r squared. And that'll be this axis. On the bottom axis, it will just be omega final squared. And so this is your y-axis, this is your x-axis. You'll get some points. I don't know what they're gonna look like. I'm just making a guess here. It'll be some line, and so the slope of this line, the slope of this line, just like in method one, is going to equal the experimental value of i. So this is using the conservation of energy slash energy rotational method to solve for the experimental value of whatever this funny looking shape is. The last thing to do is to determine what the theoretical value of i is, and we'll look at that in the next step. So now that we've uh, figured out which methods you know, there are to solve for the experimental value of i, we need to look for the theoretical value of i, or the actual value of i. And to do that, we need to see what's actually rotating. So for our apparatus, we're gonna have this rod right here. It's got some mass to it. We've got these little heavyweight masses that are gonna be attached to each side of the rod over here and over here. Um, and finally, we've got this little bit of pulley right here that also has some mass to it that's gonna be rotating. So these little pieces right here are gonna be rotating the, around the axis rotation. This bar is gonna be rotating about the center, and then this pulley is also gonna be rotating about its uh, axis of rotation right here. And what you need to do to calculate i is just to add up all the individual i's together. It's sort of like mass, you know, when you want to know how much mass, you just treat it as a system, you put it together. So let's do it individually. The first mass is going to be this right here, this little value. Uh, and the length of this rod, the length of the rod is, I wrote it down somewhere, uh, 38.3. So L equals 38.3. Um, uh, what is it? 38.3, I'm going to say centimeters. Yeah, that sounds about right. So its uh, length is 38.3 centimeters, and its mass, the mass of the rod, is equal to 29.4 grams. So it's not, it's not mathless, it's got some weight to it. So 29.4 grams. And to find the moment of inertia of this, you know, it's a rod about the center. I of the rod is equal to 1 12th mass of the rod times the length squared. So that'll be at, this, at the center. If it was at this axis, it would be 1 3rd, but we're rotating it about the center. So that's how you solve for I of the rod. The next thing is these little weights right here that are going to be attached to the rod all the way at the end, like so. And there's gonna be one over here on the other side as well, like that, all the way to the end. Now, you gotta look at it from the center of mass. The center of mass isn't at the edge. It's one centimeter away from the edge right here. So, if this is 38, 0.3 centimeters, then you know, you're going to subtract one centimeter from here and one centimeter from here, and then you're going to look at the distance from the center to how far each one of those masses are. So if this is the center right here, how far is the distance from here to the axis of rotation? That's going to be our R value. And so each one of these little masses, we'll call it the free weights, I of the free weight that's not that. There we go. Of the free weight, these are the free weights. 
is going to equal mass of the free weight times r squared, where r is the distance from here to here, so we'll call that distance r. Okay? And so what is these values? So the mass of the free weight, of one free weight, not both, just one, is given by... Okay, so the mass of each of these individual free weights is going to be 75.3 grams. That's an individual one. You got two of these, remember that. And the distance from here to here uh, would be, I don't know, it, R would equal, let's see here, the whole length is, the whole length is 38.3, you're going to divide that by 2, that's this distance right here, and um, whatever this distance right here would be, that would be minus parentheses uh, 38 well, it's one centimeter, so it'll be minus 39, 37.3 in centimeters. Uh, and this will be the absolute value. So 38.3 divided by 2 is at the center. 37.3 is where the mass is located from 0. So if you take the difference between the two, I should have written it backwards. But that's why I put the absolute value there, so you don't need to worry about the negative. You'll get the value of r. So that's what r is going to equal. And remember, you've got to multiply this by 2 because you've got a mass here and a mass over there. Um, and lastly, we've got the pulley here. So the pulley uh, is also rotating. It's got a radius here and it's got uh, some weight to it as well. So the pulley, this little pulley right here, the moment of inertia of a pulley is given by the equation 1 half mass of the pulley times, uh, we'll call it little r squared. And so, uh, what are the values here? The mass of the pulley is given by 7.1 gram. 7.1 gram is the mass of the pulley. And the radius from the center of axis rotation is given by, what did I write here? I wrote the diameter. So the radius would be half of that. So 2.5 uh, centimeters. Okay? So this is in centimeters, this is in grams. You gotta convert everything into kilograms and into meters uh, when you're doing the calculations. So you have this, you have this, you have this. How do you find the theoretical value of I? Well, that's gonna equal I of the rod plus 2 times I of the free weight, because you got a free weight there and there, plus I of the pulley. And when you add those three together, you will get the theoretical value of I. The last step to do would be to take the percent error, so the I theoretical minus I experimental, which you'll get in the next part, divided by uh, I theoretical multiplied by 100, and there'll be your experimental, uh, there'll be your percent error in what your calculation is going to be. So now all that's left to do is to actually do the experiment, um, and we'll do that in the next video. See you there.